Hey guys, in this episode, I sat down with the one, the only Katie Pavlich. She's a Fox News contributor and an editor at townhall.com. We got to talk about all kinds of cool conservative issues. We got into uh, gun legislation a little bit. We talked a little bit on Fast and Furious. She's going to come back for that one. But love Katie. She's awesome. She's super spicy. You're going to love this episode. So welcome to the show. Uh, thanks for coming on. I definitely appreciate yeah. it. I, I don't know why I didn't ask you to do this. So it was, let me rewind. I apologize because I can't believe I didn't ask you to do the show before Jack Carr. And I felt <laughs> really embarrassed when I yeah. saw your show. And I was like, Evan, you idiot. Are you kidding me? <laughs> like, how could I not have done this earlier? <laughs> Well, I was not offended, so I'm okay. really grateful that you had me on, but I wasn't sitting there thinking that, uh, you know, that I was disappointed in you. So you're good. Okay. Well, that, that makes me feel better. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> I'm a fan just in general. Like I'm a fan of, of, uh, uh, yours. I'm a fan of, uh, you know, I should say like different news segments. What was I, I was watching the other day. Uh, it was like, Greg Guffield and I think yeah. it's at the five is that is that what it's called? Yep. Yeah. Yep. So I was watching. You were on there, and uh, uh, one I think he's 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 fucking hilarious. Like yeah, he's very funny. Is, like he's very very funny. Yeah. So I'm really glad he has a late night show now because I knew he would always be able to compete with all the late night guys, and he's like killing it, and it's awesome. He just does his thing. It's so much fun. It's so much fun, and. So I was listening to you guys, and I can't remember the exact topic, but um, I was listening to you guys, and I was thinking, conservatives are so much more fun than liberals. Yeah. We have such a, a a a more defined sense of humor, and we are willing to laugh about just about anything. And it's it it, it I, I don't know if you can define it necessarily as more sophisticated, but it's like we're just willing to laugh at stuff. <laughs> Which I think is like it's a breath of fresh air that people just can say, "This is funny. I think it's hilarious. Let's laugh about it." And I don't, I don't think I could be wrong. I'm not trying to put words in your mouth. Do you think? Um, are there any liberals that are funny? Can you name any? <laughs> no, I think that Trevor Noah uh, from The Daily Show is supposed to be funny. I don't think he's funny at all. Uh, I think that comedy has taken this, and Hollywood too, has taken this term where they feel like they have to check off all these boxes of social justice wokeness. And so everything's really boring. Everything's the same. There's no creativity anymore about what people want to do because they're too scared to offend anybody. And I think that the right side of the political spectrum is more open to just you know, tolerating other people's perspectives and ideas and not being offended and trying to ruin people's lives because, you know, you don't like something. It's like, we have the freedom to turn something off if we don't want to watch it. We have the freedom to watch another comedian or pursue different, you know, movies and series and books if we don't like it. Like no one is forcing us because we live in a country where we have choice for now um, to, to be forced into listening to people that we don't like. And so instead of sitting there and complaining and making it your life's work to ruin someone over something that you don't like, you just find things that you do. And I think that, you know, the right now, ironically, is kind of going back to this kind of classical liberalism of, you know, liberalism sounds great. Like I'm open-minded, I'm tolerant, I love everything and I want to learn about new things. Right. Um, but that's very different than being like a leftist where it's authoritarian and you can only do or say certain things. So I, I agree with that for sure. And uh, it's definitely more fun uh, life is a lot more fun if you can laugh about things. And, uh, you know, if you don't like something, you don't have to engage. But this whole idea of just, you know, making everyone's life miserable because you don't like something, you know, the whole, that's not funny. Like, right. Right. Everyone just calm down. Have a little laugh. It's going to be okay. <laughs> you know, no one's dying. Like, this is not a serious situation. Like, we can just move on. So yeah, I think the right has has really found its way in a lot of places now with an opportunity of just people being so uptight about everything. And yeah, you know, that doesn't mean you don't have to have standards, you know, you don't want to be rude no. in certain situations. Um, but this whole idea that you just can't have a differing 
opinion or joke about things, right? Everything's a big offense all the time. It's a pretty boring way to live life, I think. It, it, it seems boring. Right, it, yeah, it's very it's boring. really boring. It seems very locked up in their their ideologically, you know, thinking. Um, and I don't know, like I've I've had I've had a really hard time the last few years in the context of like you know these definitions that we we're lumping ourselves, whether it's like liberal or conservative. And I shouldn't say it's a hard time. It's just like think about it. I'm like, okay, yeah. so what really makes a conservative? Uh, define itself as a conservative. And yeah. that was one of the questions I had here was like, in your mind, you know, when I think I, I, I want to just get your definition of what does it mean to be conservative to you? And and then I got a follow on question after you answered that one. But what does it mean yeah. to be conservative in America today? So I, you know, uh, because I'm open minded, yeah. uh, I try not to define being a conservative for other people. Like I know why I am a conservative. Like I yeah. want the government to, you know, let me keep more of my own, my own money. I think that people should be able to think for themselves. Uh, I think that the federal government does a lot of things wrong and crushes, uh, you know, ambition and opportunity because bureaucrats who live in Washington, DC think they know better. And this is a place where we have very different viewpoints across the country and lots of diversity and, everyone's different. Like these one size fits all policies don't apply to everybody and they end up being a total catastrophe. And I think COVID last year is a really good example of that. Right. Um, you know, I, I love this country. Uh, I'm proud to be an American. I'm proud of my family's history in this country. Um, you know, I'm proud that I am a gun owner. Like I appreciate the fact that we have a constitution where I can make a living using the first amendment and I can defend myself using the second amendment and that the government can't just come into my house and, you know, look for things and, and make me a criminal under the fourth amendment. I mean, there's just so many things that I believe in that have become so controversial. Um, and all of a sudden like a right wing idea, whereas I feel like it's just kind of like part of being, you know, an American. Um, I, I love that Margaret Thatcher, who of course was the prime minister of, of Great Britain, used yeah. to say that the facts of life are conservative. And I think as I get older, um, just personal responsibility, the idea that like if I screw up, it's on me. Like no one's gonna take me out of that. Like I don't wanna be a victim. You know, it's easy to say, you know, I'm a woman and the world's against me and all this stuff. And I just don't subscribe to that kind of attitude. Right. Uh, and so that's why I'm a conservative. Um, I think the definition has certainly changed and it's grown a lot. There's room for lots of different kinds of people. Right. Um, but it's, it's an open, tolerant ideology. You know, there's, I know all kinds of people who say that they're conservatives and they are not the same as I am. Like they, mm -hmm. they have very different interests and, um, hobbies, but their values are the same in the sense that they don't want the government telling them what to do. They work really hard, want to be rewarded for that. And, they don't walk around acting like the world owes them something, you know, which I think when you walk around like that, your life gets pretty miserable because nobody owes you anything. <laughs> like you got to work hard, you know, make your own way. And at the end of the day, like you're the one who's going to have to do it for yourself. No one else can do it for you. And so I just find that's a happier way to live really. Yeah. It, it's interesting to me, you know, because your definition isn't really that far out from my definition. And, mm -hmm. you know, talking to people from across the political spectrum uh, over the last several years, and then having a company with the name Black Rifle Coffee Company, right? So by definition yeah. from one... Very triggering. Country, very <laughs> triggered. They're like, oh my God, it's, I'm so triggered. Well. You know? It's like, <laughs> and, uh, and, it's, and it's funny because part of that is just like, yeah, man, like, like I'm trying to trigger you because words... Like there's an old saying. I don't know if you've ever heard it. It's called sticks and stones break my bones, but words yeah. break words and never yeah. hurt me, right? <laughs> I think I learned that when I was like four. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think <laughs> really there's old. <laughs> a portion of the country that has forgotten about this whole thing where yeah. you guys, when you're taking yourselves way too serious, like this is like my service rifle. And to your point, like I love the police. Like mm -hmm. a huge amount of my yep. friends got out of military service. They went into law enforcement. You know, they serve their communities with dignity and honor every day, right? And there's yeah. just no way in hell I would be willing to step up and say, 
you know, these police departments across America are really, uh, they, they need fundamental reconstruction or defunding or whatever it might be. Because statistically, this, from my perspective, there's too many good people in law enforcement. And oh, by the yeah. way, a family and a home and it's safe where I live. You right. Know, it's clean. It's safe. Thank you for going out and literally like keeping the streets safe for me and my family every day. Because there right. is that point in inflection uh, or the flexion point for conservatives, which is taking on all of your responsibility for your personal freedom. Well, that's like right. anarchy and lawlessness. Okay, so I get I get that, right? So deterioration of law. But I'm like, thank you for the law enforcement out there and thank you for everything they do. But when did that and how, like, these are some points that we were talking about earlier, which is how did saying I respect law enforcement and what they have to go through every day in their lives. When they put on their uniforms, they go out and address you know, the people that are speeding, the people that are getting DUIs, the people that are committing crimes. I, how did that all of a sudden mean that you're engaging in a culture war by saying, no, I, I really respect the rule right. of law and I respect police officers and what they have to do in this country. How does that make you engaging in the culture war in America by saying that you appreciate and admire the the level of professionalism these guys have to go through every day. Yeah, yeah, no, it's uh. So to first answer that question, I think it's a broader philosophical question about Western society and the rule of law, a mob rule versus uh, you know the Constitution and the idea that we get trials in America, we have right. due process. Uh, we have law and order. We have people who work for the state who protect uh, the law abiding and protect them from the criminals, right? We don't, you know, it used to be that criminal elements were punished uh, for breaking the laws that are passed through a system of elected officials voting on something that is then signed by an executive. So it's all a process of, um, of thinking of things and agreeing on them and democracy and voting these laws in that then can be enforced by people who have to go through the academy and who have right. to take an oath and, and take, you know, classes in their academies about ethics and policing. And there's this whole system, right? And so when you hear them talk about systemic racism, which is why they say they need to tear the system down, right? they don't like that system. And right. it's, it's a, it's a bigger philosophy than just like, you know, the police officer in your, your neighborhood. Right. I think part of the problem is that a lot of the people who have driven this narrative uh, over the past seven years, I think it really started ramping up again in 2014 yeah. um, when Michael Brown was shot uh, in St. Louis. Um, when you listen to the people who are, who are driving this narrative, it's like the Al Sharptons of the world. It's the Benjamin Crumps who are making money off of people's um, misery. And they're, you know, it's, it's, it's a class issue. So they're not really there to solve the problem. They're there to hype up the media. They're there to, <laughs> to make some political points. And it actually makes things much worse. And I, I wasn't old enough in the 1990s to understand the crime wave uh, that was going on. And the reason that, you know, there was murder was like cut in half over the next 20 years once they passed the 1994 crime bill. But what I'm seeing now, because I live right outside of Washington, D.C., and I'm in New York a lot, is just astonishing to me just the anti-police attitude the lack of prosecution um allowing criminals to just run wild i mean like they're arresting these guys over and over and over again and they just keep getting let out and that's a breakdown of like that's a breakdown in the rule of law when yeah. you know these the criminals are really running the show here and you have like murders skyrocketing in all of these places um and i think that comes from this bigger issue of saying, you know, all police are bad. Right. And every single time there may be a situation where a police officer did act inappropriately, the media takes it and completely blows it out of proportion and puts that decision on every single officer throughout the country. And it turns into this massive snowball effect of policy, um, you know, the federal government trying to implement policy through the Justice Department to police local jurisdictions, which is insane because every jurisdiction is different. You know, what happens in New York City is very different than what happens in small town Texas or Utah or in Arizona. They have different problems to deal with. And so I think the switch really did come in 2014 with President Obama when, you know, you had that a Harvard professor uh, going into the wrong house and the police were called, the police came 
And the president of the United States was like, oh, the officer acted stupidly and kind of reengaged this argument that the police are racist, that they are going out hunting down black men in the streets, which is not true. Um, so it's all, I think, based on a false narrative to ask your to answer your question about when did we when did it become that you can't just defend the police and that, you know, thanking these guys for their service is is a controversial ideal you know, idea. Um, it's really came around that time and this idea that they've just completely generalized everyone rather than taking things on a case by case basis and thinking logically about why maybe there would be a situation um, where an officer had to use lethal, lethal force. I also think that a lot of people in the media are completely out of touch. I mean, I've done that uh, simulation training where yeah. you're put in a position like an officer and you have to decide whether you're going to shoot or not. Right. And it's really, really stressful, even in a simulator. And yeah. none of, you know, I would say like 99.5% of the media has never done that, right? right? And they're completely disengaged from the actual issue. And so, um, yeah, I think it's really tough right now in terms of that narrative. And it uh, doesn't make a lot of sense to me, but there are consequences for it. And uh, I just refuse to engage in that. You know, I mean, it's like, no, I like the police. I right. like being able to walk down the street and not feel like I'm going to get mugged. You know, I think it's important for communities who pay taxes uh, to be able to live in a safe place and for kids to be able to, I don't know, ride the, the, the train in Chicago uh, after their internship and go back to college without getting struck in the neck by a bullet and dying on the way. Right. Like right. those are things that I don't like. I think that everyone has the right to live in a safe environment. And the current environment is just so enraging because it enables the worst kinds of society. And it's being completely pushed by different levels like the prosecution by the media um by these leftist activists who have gotten into positions of authority to demonize good people who want to protect their communities and so you know thank god for people like you and your company who are you know, backing the police and people who continue to sign up for the job because there's so many people you know i don't know why you would want to so i really admire people who who are doing that now yeah it's it's um it, it's a strange time that we live in, and my uh, my 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 close friend. He was a police officer. He was killed in um, uh, Iraq. Actually, he was over there uh, two thousand six. So he was going back and forth between law enforcement and working in um, Iraq with with me. It's a former Green Beret. I've been mm -hmm. talking to his widow today uh, about kind of what she's she's uh, remarried to a, another police officer from the mm -hmm. Seattle area, and just looking. From her perspective, you know, she's lost one husband in war that was also, you know, a police officer and a Green Beret. And then watching Seattle, the the, the city that yeah. she's like raised her kids and she loves just deteriorate in her in her eyes, and not in her eyes, but right in front of her. And, you know, looking at the the issues that are kind of fundamental to that that city. But the big thing that we 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 were we were unpacking here in my office, and we were talking about um, how there's this real disconnect between the people that actually live with police officers and know police officers and know what they have to go through on an on an hourly, daily, weekly, monthly cadence. How much stress is in their life? Uh, how much responsibility and ownership that they take for their communities, and then to see the city and like in their city officials to turn on right. the department uh, almost entirely. It, it's one, the emotional pain that it gives me, like it truly does give me pain. When I, when I see the amount of uh, hate and vitriol that is pushed out and what the, the guys that I know that are police officers that have to go through this, where she was telling me a story about, this guy that I know very relatively well, where he had to move his family out of the city because of a new position that he was in, because he was getting death threats and people were, mm -hmm. um, you know, protesting and you know painting graffiti across his house. And it's like, here's a guy that's protected his city for 20 years. He took a new position in the police in the police department, and now he has to move because he's afraid that his family is going to be targeted by a bunch of crazy people in right. you know, a way. No city official is coming to his right. aid. Mm -hmm. like, hey, everybody, we need to calm down. These guys are out there protecting and serving every day. And it, 
I don't know, and I, I don't expect you to have an answer for this, but you're, you talk to a lot more people than I do probably on these subjects, which is how do you flip the script? Mm-hmm. Is it just, how do we flip the script in this where in, in, you guys have to be talking about this, right? And I'm, I'm just assuming you are. Yeah. How do you flip the script? Is it through media? Is, it, is that what you consider some of your job is to flip the script? I think just telling the truth about the situation, right? right. I mean, a lot of the, the you know, for example, um, you know, two months ago when that, that officer in Ohio um, saved that girl from being yeah. stabbed to death by another girl. Right. And LeBron James tweets out that, you know, he, he's a racist cop because he shot the girl. And it's like, I think you just, and you know, it seems like such a, a kind of a David and Goliath things. Like how many Twitter followers does LeBron James have? Right. But people push back and he deleted the tweet. Now the damage was done in a lot of ways, Good. but you have to just kind of push back on all of these basics, you know, these instances of situations with the facts. I mean, I remember when, when Jacob Blake uh, was shot in Wisconsin, Right. And, you know, the first thing that everybody says, not everybody, but most people say is, oh, another black man shot by police, by a white officer. And it's like, OK, well, let's look at this situation and what happened. Guy shows up with a warrant at his ex-girlfriend's house who he had previously sexually assaulted. Uh, he was not complying with officers orders when they knew he was a dangerous person. Right. Uh, he kidnapped the children and put them in the car and was trying to drive away with them. That's why they were in the car. Right. Uh, and that's why he was shot in front of them. And he also had a knife, which he refused to drop. So when you tell people that, I think they're like, okay, I get it. Like, obviously it makes sense. Right. Right. But the first thing out the door is this false narrative that every single police shooting is racially motivated. And that's just not true. So I think just telling the truth about each individual case as much as you possibly can would 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 be helpful, and I think it has been helpful. Um, and you know, I think encouraging on the local level in these local communities, uh, people who are serving and to protect their communities. I mean, when I was a kid, I remember a police officer in my hometown, of Flagstaff, who was young, was like twenty two, um, was responding to a domestic violence uh, call. He was shot and killed. And I distinctively remember my parents taking us to his, to his funeral procession in town. Right. So I think like people taking their kids to do that stuff is it really does impact them for a lifetime. I remember uh, when I was traveling last fall with attorney general, Bill Barr, we went to the the funeral of a Cleveland police officer who was killed by teenagers um, because he was working with the federal government on operation legend, which is the program that's trying to solve un solved murders in right. cities that really need the help. And so these things really are distinctive experiences that I think shape people's lives. But I think just telling the truth, you know, like really like fighting back and not allowing them to get away with a narrative just because it's politically correct or people are scared to talk about it because it involves race, you know, but they do that on purpose. It's a tactic mm-hmm. to kind of get people not to talk about it. Um, and I think officers like telling their own stories too, right. you know, Showing, you know, it was amazing how, remember when they canceled Live PD? Oh, yeah. Canceled that show. Well, they yeah. can't, that was not an accident. Like they, they canceled that show because it showed America what officers actually go through, that their job is difficult, that they're good everyday people trying to do the, the best to protect their community and to quite frankly, protect the people they're arresting, right? I mean, half That's... of those, half of those encounters were like, hey man, let me help you get home or hey. let me get you to the hospital. Good people doing good things. And they erase that because it erases their narrative and it gets rid of their power to tear down the system, which they don't like. And so I think, you know, fighting it is just a matter of like, you know, having, you know, really just trying to tell the truth in each situation. Um, on a political level, you have to win elections, right? I mean, Department of Justice now has these two like virulently anti police um, assistant attorney general and associate attorney general in charge of police now. Like, that's, you know, that's not good either. But I think on just like a general individual level, you can kind of push back with the facts and not be afraid because it's a tough topic. Um, it's important. So, well, do you think, um, do you think that in this, uh, let, give me a second to unpack this, which is, do you think there's a loss of journalistic integrity that has led to uh, 
a devalue of information and sometimes just straight up propaganda. Yeah. Uh, that has, has, you know, gaslit a certain portion. Uh, and a gaslit is such an over, overused uh, uh, word or series of words. But do you think there's been a, a, a devalue of kind of our traditional media outlets because they've decided to engage on these levels and then put out... Because I look at traditional media as, um, in, in some circumstances, it's just straight propaganda at this point. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. And I think what's happened is be, as the marketplace has gr- has been more opened up, you know, there's podcasting, there's social yeah. media, there's all kinds of different media now. You know, websites. Uh, it used to be that there were three networks and a couple newspapers, yeah. and that was it. And everyone believed that they were fair and balanced, and that there was journalistic integrity, right. and that they were just reporting the news. Um, I think that maybe that was kind of true, but I think as there's been an opening up of of the market and the availability of more people to become journalists and to be in media, that it's really kind of just exposed that it's not that they were necessarily just reporting the news, it's that they had a narrative and a bias, but there wasn't a platform for others to tell the other side of the story right. or to have a different perspective. And I think there's there's bias in everything, right? Like yeah. there's bias in if you're located in New York City, you're going to report on things that happen in New York City. You're not going to report mostly on things that happen in other places. There are always decisions that are made. And I'm going to report on something differently than someone else might report on something. But the difference is that I'm, I think that if you're, if you're honest about where you're coming from, you're, you have more credibility, right? Like I am honest about the fact that I come at things from a right leaning perspective. I don't pretend like I don't have that kind of, ideology going into something right um whereas like a cnn still pretends like they're <laughs> you know super journos and they're super honest and they're totally fair and want to make sure they have all the facts when it's just blatantly obvious that that's not the case and i think it's more offensive to people that they lie about that like anybody can see it's clearly not fair or not maybe fair is not the right word um i would say objective right, right? Um, and I think that's why they, a lot of these people lose credibility. So it's like, well, at least the people who know they, they come at this from a per- certain perspective are being honest with me. So they're not treating me like I'm stupid. <laughs> right? <Yeah. laughs> Whereas like these other people talk down to you, like you don't understand how to be a journalist. <laughs> right. Your job is very serious and you just <laughs> don't get it. <laughs> um, so I think that, you know, that's really the problem. And, um, I think that you can just kind of see that. And I think that's like the blessing of this whole new media landscape is, yeah, there's a lot of garbage, uh, but there's also a way to kind of push back on this narrative that this is the only way that you can see things and holding people accountable for the information that they're putting out there. So do they, do you guys, um, you know, at Fox, do you guys discuss that as, is like, um, you know, in your strategy as far as like development of media, do you guys discuss new media as as a form of competition, or are you looking at mainly the the traditional outlets as your competition? Are you looking at them both? I think you have to look at everything. You know, I am um, a contributor at Fox. So I'm not really in a lot of meetings in terms of strategy for for them, but for Town Hall, I certainly am. And yeah. um, I think that you just have to. I remember going through journalism school and. It was right at the beginning of when you had to do everything on your own. Like you had to know how to write a script. You had to film all your own stuff. You had to edit your own stuff. And you also had to do your stand up by yourself. And that was a a new concept. You know, before it was, you had a cameraman, you had an editor, you had a script writer. And a lot of the big networks still have that. Right. On a local level, that was totally changing. And so you had to learn how to do everything. And I think competition is just in everything. I mean, the digital space. Um, video, podcasting. And I think that the best people will rise to the top of that. You know, people get to choose what they want to listen to and what they want to watch. And so I think that's a good way to hold, you know, for accountability for, you know, people and the the kind of products they're putting out. If they don't like what you're selling, what you're doing, then they just don't have to watch it. Right. So it's definitely, um, it makes it more challenging for sure. But I think it also provides an opportunity for, people who want to be doing media to do it well, because that's what people are looking for when there's so much available. Right. 
Mm-hmm. Do you worry about uh, the censorship or deplatforming aspects of the, yeah. the information that that maybe you might be interested in putting out? Do you is that an everyday <laughs> thought? Or how how concerned are you over just the 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 topic of censorship or deplatforming? No, oh, it's a huge problem. I mean, the face the fact checkers are right. uh, absurd. I mean, the fact checkers are basically like these people who get hired as third parties for Facebook, for example, right? who claim to be objective, right? but they really are like activists, you know? And so they'll shut down traffic to your page. They'll flap you with a misinformation label on an article. I remember we wrote a review of a Wall Street Journal book review Mm -hmm. on one of President Obama's energy secretaries or top physicists at the energy department who's arguing that climate change is not as big of a of an emergency as the conventional narrative says it is and like facebook just took took it down and censored it and said oh well this third party fact checker says that it's it's misleading right and it's like okay so here's it's not misleading it's that you don't like what he's saying right about the information that you you have a different perspective on it. You think right. it's, it's a catastrophe. He thinks it's not a catastrophe and gives scientific arguments as to why not. I mean, this is one of the top physicists and scientists in the whole country. Right. And yet no one's allowed to review his book. Right. I, mean, I think that's a really incredible, scary thing. And I, I don't know how to fix it because I don't think I, I don't think that the government will do a good job of regulating these things. I mean Right. When you listen to these hearings with these tech CEOs, like the senators can hardly get through like what a GIF is or, you know, or coding. And <laughs> they don't know how any of this works and yet they're supposed to be regulating it. Right. Um, but no, I think it's a huge, huge problem just in the sense of the principle of not censoring information, but like what they're censoring is true, true information. I mean, the Hunter Biden stuff. Yeah. Last year that they just completely took off the internet, the lab leak theory. Yeah. Um, I mean, all of the stuff that has real consequences for people, right? I mean, why is it that we weren't allowed to know about the lab leak theory? Why is it that, you know, certain medications were suppressed for COVID? Like why we're not allowed to talk about any of that? Um, that's pretty scary. It's scary. I and I I think that like there's so much there. The the lab leak theory is one that to, mm-hmm. That's the one that I just I really couldn't understand at all. Okay, I get it. You know, the Hunter Biden thing, whether or not like photos were doctored or finding out whether or not the mm-hmm. information is factual or not factual. Like, there's a lot of shit. There's a, there's a lot of shit there, right? So yeah, let's just put that <laughs> one off to the side. Like, let's put that one off to the side. Like the crack yeah. pipe, the t- hot tub, or whatever was going on, man. Like, hey, I, I hopefully had a good time. Like, uh, yeah. but the lab leak theory is Mm -hmm. a legitimate theory. And any, I think, logical person put things together going, so the Wuhan lab is here (laughs) and the virus originated here. Those are the same place, right? Yeah. Maybe we should look into this a little bit further. Yeah. But if you put that out, you are automatically bucketed into, you know, like wars type crazy over here and nothing against those. I'm just saying like, you're already bucketed into like, you can talk about it in the office. Like people were like crazy about this. Where you're like, no, but seriously, you guys, like, yeah. don't you think that's weird? Like this is like a Scooby yeah. type episode to me where we should at least like look into this and we can have the open conversation about it. Right? Don't you don't right? Yeah, it's like, like, look, I'm not gonna say I don't think that people might be eating bats. Like maybe they're eating bats. I don't know. Like maybe know. they like bats. I don't know. But you know, this idea that we're just not allowed to talk about it. And for me, at the beginning of this, if you know anything about China, if you right. know anything about how China has handled pandemics in the past, right? It's like duh, like even before the connection was made to between, you know, oh, the Wuhan Institute of Virology is in Wuhan, where this is from. It's like, yeah, it's China. It probably did leak from a lab. Like, if you know anything about communism, and they're like disappearing doctors, people are dying, they're like welding <laughs> apartment buildings shut, and you're like, hmm, this seems like a real problem, but they're telling us it's not a big deal. But I see yes, the welding apartment like, hey, yeah. buildings shut. They're yeah. like, it's fine. 
it doesn't, it does not, does not contagious at all. Even though there's like 40,000 cell phones that are now gone. gone. You know? It's just like, you know, and, and that's what I think was crazy. It's like, people are so disconnected from these ideologies that are just like so different than the way that we operate in like Western society. Yeah. That they just, they were like giving the Chinese communist party the benefit of the doubt. Yeah. Like, no, no, no. That's not how this works. Like they probably screwed up. They probably, you know, not to mention maybe they were trying to build things in the lab for bioweapons purposes. Like they don't have the same value system that we do. Okay. Right. <laughs> like this, like, they're just so naive about where this could have come from. And this idea that we, they just, anything that was put online from scientists, quoting scientists who were looking at the, the genome sequence and going, this is not natural. Right. Like, this wasn't a bunch of kooks just making it up. It was scientists who have experience in the U.S. military, at the Department of Defense, in labs across America, were saying, look, we've been doing this weird gain-of-function research, which is basically like Frankensteining viruses for some reason. We're doing that. And the genome looks like it was man-made. And we're not allowed to question Dr. Fauci, even though he's funding all these things. I mean, the the fact that we weren't allowed to... That's the thing about the media is like, you're supposed to question authority that's your whole yeah. job like that's right. the, that's what they teach you in school the whole point of the media is to hold the, the state accountable <laughs> and yet they were just reprinting everything that the state was saying without bringing in a different perspective and science is supposed to be all about debate and evolving and hypothesis i mean these are basic concepts that we learn when we're in high school about the way the scientific process works and yet we weren't allowed to question anything. And now, especially all these emails have come out, like the mass stuff where now she's telling a congresswoman, you know, the, the, the droplets are too small to get through, you know, for the mask to protect you. Yeah. But then we're all like still wearing masks on the planes. And it's okay. So if we're following the science, did the droplets get bigger? Right. Are the droplets bigger now? So like the mask actually works, you know, so all these things that, had detrimental effects on people's lives. And we joke about it, but people's lives were destroyed as a result of this lack of questioning and, you know, follow-ups or providing a different perspective. And yet there's been zero accountability for it. And it's just really amazing. And I don't know if it's that people are ignorant about the way that China works. They have an affinity for believing that communist regimes are honest Right. I don't know, but it just was obvious from the beginning that we weren't going to get the truth about this and that China was going to lie about all of it. Psst. Kayla, did you know with Black Rifle Coffee's Coffee Club subscription, you can get fresh coffee shipped to you every month? What? You don't even have to go to the store. Whoa. You don't even have to leave your bed. What? Wow. How did you get in here? You might want to go ahead and join the Black Rifle Coffee Club subscription before one of these guys shows up at your place. And then the complete repeating of Chinese Communist Party propaganda. Okay. It wasn't even just not pushing back on U.S. officials. It was repeating word for word. Oh, the Chinese Communist Party says it's from a bat. So okay. that's true. And if you dare say it's from a lab, then you're a conspiracy theorist. Okay. <laughs> Great. Wow. It's so astounding to me because I think that you can basically run with a few facts and assumptions. Okay, so any piece of information that is, comes out of the Chinese, Chinese Communist Party uh, is, needs to be questioned. Like, yeah. not only questioned, but you have to tear it apart. Anything. Mm-hmm. Like, it doesn't matter. You have to assume it's false. You have yeah. to assume. If they said, the world is round, you still have to go, <laughs> yeah, exactly. we got to fact check it. We have yep. to assume it's a lie. That's mm-hmm. just our job. I think as Americans, you have to just assume whatever is coming out of the party has to be taken as a, as, as a lie. Just assume, yeah. right? And your point of, you know, the journalists, their job is to question authority. Mm-hmm. And there was such a uh, subservient mentality to, uh, there's like, 
all these different things happening, obviously, over the course of the last couple of years. And there's this lack of ability to question authority. Like mm-hmm. just, and whoever was doing it in any capacity was like, okay, man, unless you're questioning the, 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 the president because the orange man was yeah. bad. The orange man. Yeah. yeah. And the orange man's fine. Yeah. Question him, but anything yeah. else, like don't, you, you cannot question that. Let's believe the Chinese government, but let's absolutely throw the president under the bus because mm-hmm. he probably doesn't know what he's talking about. <laughs> Which is insane. It's completely insane. insane. <laughs> like you're going to trust the Chinese Communist Party over the president. I mean, you don't have to take everything the president says as no. truth, but the idea that you were willing to throw him under the bus for talking points coming out of communist China. And what they were trying to do with this whole thing was, you know, Dr. Fauci and the bureaucrats in Washington who have been doing this for 40 years, not, you know, working in labs and dealing with patients, but basically being spokespeople. Right. uh, They are smarter because Trump is a moron. Trump is an idiot. And we should not listen to anything he says at all. And certainly no matter who is saying that he's an idiot, including the Chinese Communist Party, we're going to go with that because that's our political implication, right? Right. even though we're fair and we're journalists and we're totally objective. And so, you know, looking back at the beginning of that whole thing, it's just amazing to watch the line of questioning in the White House press corps about calling it the Chinese virus and how that was really racist and how um, the, the president was overreacting by you know talking about maybe implementing some of these policies. And then they completely you know, use the term gaslit. Two or three months later, they're accusing the White House of not taking it seriously. Enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it was really yeah. amazing, even though they were the ones who were saying it's just like the flu. Right. Why is Trump panicking? Why are we implementing a, a travel ban from China and all these other countries? Right. Are we are, are we overreacting? And then they totally switched it yeah. and acted like they weren't the ones who were downplaying it from the beginning. Um, that was astounding to watch that whole thing just flip. But it's so confusing from the outside. When I look and watch uh, the... Well, and I, I don't watch all media, obviously. That would be impossible. But when you have I, a, a real job, a company a to real, run. You know? yeah, a real job. <laughs> but it, it, it blows me away because people have such short memories. Yeah. So... And you're watching this kind of from the outside unfold going, but but hold on, wait, you guys like two months ago, I, and I like how, and I'll kind of rewind and I'll think, think 360 for a minute, but I think how conservatives have become anti-war now. So we're like, mm-hmm. we're going stop the endless wars, get mm-hmm. our troops home. You know, this is like a very prominent uh, talking point for a lot of my conservative friends. This right. was not a conservative talking point uh, right. during the Iraq Ten, war. 15 years all. ago, right. It wasn't. Yeah. It was not a talking point because people were like, we got to go. And it was the the other side that was like, no, you know, this is an illegal, unjustified war. We can't invade. Like, this is blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, you guys were on the same, like we were on the same team. And yeah. we've been on the same team if we had rewinded the clock like 10, 10 years ago. And trust me, I was on the other 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 team. I was like, "Hey, we we got to take some of these countries. It's regime change." Like, yeah. I'm thinking the Kool Aid, man. Like, I, I wanted it all. <laughs> like, like let's get it on. I want I want to do it all. You know, and, I want Greenland, so we can go there yeah. next. <laughs> like, I want to go someplace cool next. Like, that would be awesome. I'm too old now, yeah. but whatever. <laughs> um, but it, it's interesting to me that on on a topic that's so important to Mm -hmm. American lives, American taxpayers, that we can't even get our shit together to talk about how we can end some of these literally endless wars. Mm -hmm. The Pentagon would keep us in in Afghanistan as far as I'm concerned. Like The Pentagon in uh, Northrop Grumman would would be fine with us being in Afghanistan for the next 200 years. They'd be like, this is like, keep keep them tax dollars flowing, guys. Like we, We love it. Right, they would be totally contractors different. would love it too. Yeah, contractors mm-hmm. would love it. I, yeah, the Pentagon Papers came out how long ago? Like when did those Pentagon? Forty papers? years ago. Oh yeah, that was the uh, that was ago? for the Vietnam War, but the uh, Afghan Papers for the Afghan War. Oh yeah, yeah, ten years, years ago. So I think ten years ago, maybe not that long ago, but it was a while ago. It wasn't like last year, you right. know. And they came be- out, and we still stayed. Yeah, they came out and they're like, basically, there's no way we're going to win this. Uh, anything and everything we do is just 
quite literally and effectually. We're, we're, we're going to be non-effective. And I, I, I'm trying to coalesce like a, a series of ideas because, you know, I think I'm a fairly logical human being. I've got political uh, beliefs that are across the board. Uh, and I try to talk to people like fairly regularly. Like, and I talk to people all the time where I'm, uh, and I've explained them like, I explain to people like this, like, Dan Crenshaw is a friend of mine. And I'm not saying mm-hmm. that. Like, look at how cool I am. I have a new <laughs> friend. I like Dan. I like him a lot. He's a really yeah. good guy. He's a great human, actually. He's a great man. I don't yeah. believe with 100% of what he believes. Right. Right. But I believe in Dan, right? Mm-hmm. We, can dif- yeah. we can have difference of opinions. And the other thing is, I like Tulsi Gabbard. She's a yeah. great human. She's a wonderful person. I don't believe everything that she that she says. I don't believe in everything she believes politically, but I can both respect their opinion and also disagree with them. <laughs> like, right. 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 Well, you use the word logic. And a lot of the time I hear from people, you know, why is it that common sense seems so uncommon? Right. And I don't think that common sense is a great way of explaining the process of getting to a amicable decision or on the same page on something. So I think logic, you can have t- two completely different political perspectives. But if you think of something logically, you come to a conclusion and you may not like the conclusion and it may not fit in with your overall philosophy, but it is the logical conclusion. Right. And you can agree or disagree on it, but you can agree that it was a logical process and that it, you came to this this ending point after thinking it through. And so if people engaged it more in logical thinking Mm -hmm. uh, on a variety of different issues, I think that we would be better off in terms of our, our discourse rather than, you know, thinking that common, common sense implies that everybody thinks the same. Right. Common sense implies that everybody's brought up the same way that everybody has the same values. Uh, Whereas with logic, it it requires a, you know, person to really think through something um, and maybe come to, the same conclusion, but not agree with it, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. And I think that was like the whole thing with last year too. And just going back to COVID, I think people got really frustrated because you're asking them to completely ignore their own logical instinct and process. Like they're telling us to wear these paper masks from Walgreens. Yeah. Like you go and buy them and it says on the box, first of all, it's made in China. Right. And second of all, it actually says this will not protect you against COVID-19. <laughs> but they're like requiring people wear them for the <laughs> sake of protecting you and someone else against COVID-19. So stuff like that, it just drives you crazy. Like all these people are making me feel crazy, but they're being crazy, you know? Um, and it's probably the same with, you know, a number of other things. Like you, you know, we're on the other side of the Afghanistan thing. You've thought about it logically know a lot of people who've been there and you have a different conclusion now you know does it maybe that's not the conclusion everyone wanted right i mean today they're talking about it and they're saying it's not a mission accomplished situation that sucks you know it sucks not to be like mission accomplished but the logical conclusion is that we can't stay forever right we have to leave there's no logical way to continue to be there in a way that doesn't you know engage uh, that doesn't result in casualties for the United States of America and for what purpose, right? Yeah, so I, I think that's where they missed. I, I think that's where we missed. We missed uh the opportunity, I think, as a country, as uh a, you know, our political officials, uh the Pentagon, like there's so many different misses, which is you have to, I think at least if you're going to invade a country, you have to have minimum success criteria for what you're trying to mm-hmm. like these are the minimum things that we will accomplish before we withdraw. So at this point, you can kind of go to work on a checklist saying, these are the things that we will accomplish, and then we will start to withdraw. But if the yard line always shifts, and there's never right. success criteria, and there's only these really kind of uh, abstract or esoteric uh, things that you know the Pentagon throws out every now and again, or some think tank decides, or the next mm-hmm. administration rolls in. No, the next administration needs to have an open conversation with the American public based on the previous minimum success criteria and say, "I know we've already accomplished or not accomplished, but this is what we're doing, and this is why." Um, 
I think there's a uh, fundamental lack of accountability uh, from yeah. both the media and the public. And for the expectation is this is what we will have. If we are going to send American lives overseas and risk life, limb, and eyesight, and then spend the taxpayer dollars, we have to have at least this in order to do that. Uh, I don't think we were, we, we were given some of that. And I remember the strategic uh, objectives for the war on terror, which was to deny sanctuary mm-hmm. to any terrorist elements, regardless of, you know, um, uh, boundary of country or something like that, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so have we denied terrorists the sanctuary in Afghanistan and allowed the ability for uh, uh, terrorist elements to grow within the borders of Afghanistan? We absolutely have accomplished that. I don't think that they can mount an attack against Western states from the country of Afghanistan. I do not think that I do not think they can do that. So we accomplished that, I think, uh, a decade plus ago. Uh, yeah. I, I could be wrong. Um, but I think the the lack of clear objectives, being able to say, because can you, I mean, you've been in media for a long time. Like, can you, can you define or can you think of a time in the modern history where the president has said, these are the exact objectives that we will accomplish in order to define mission success in country X? I mean, I guess the most recent example would be eradicating Iraq of ISIS uh, yeah. after U.S. forces pull out of there. I think yeah. that President Trump was pretty clear that his goal was to get rid of the caliphate that they had developed. He didn't want to get involved in Syria. He didn't want to launch a ground war. Um, and I think that the situation there was really... Uh, it was easier for people to do their jobs. I think a lot of the reason, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think a lot of the reason why the Afghanistan war uh, has drawn out for so long and why there were so many casualties uh, in Iraq was because of the rules of engagement. It was like an, under Obama that, you know, they had to call in strikes on, you know, targets and have to get approval from higher ups rather than just being able to take out a target and do their jobs. And I think, you know, you saw the casualty rate skyrocket by something like 100%. And then the maiming rate in Afghanistan went up to 500%. The majority of casualties happened then. And it was a result of the changing of the rules of engagement and hesitation, right? Um, and I think that if you can't, not going to allow people to get the job done, then don't send them there. <laughs> They're not going to allow them to, to, you know, take out guys who are planting IEDs on the side of the road. Um, then what are they doing there? Because you're just putting them in harm's way, right? So I think that also played a role. Um, but in terms of changing the goalposts, I mean, I think that when George W. Bush went into Afghanistan and into Iraq, the goals were stated, you know, weapons of mass destruction didn't pan out. Yeah. Um, but then after that, they just kept kind of changing what the objective was. And it was a broad and, and generalized statement. And I, and I have friends who disagree with leaving Afghanistan who were there, who lost friends there who worked as civilians there. Um, but I think you can game out the what ifs forever. Uh, and the question is, what is the the cost of that? Right. Um, I think there's a lot of frustration too, from people who, you know, I have a friend whose husband was killed in Afghanistan and she gets the question from the media now that we're leaving, you know, was it worth it? And she kind of throws it back to them and says, don't ask me that question. You know, Americans, vote for representatives who sent my husband to war. Right. Is it worth it for you? Right. You know, you're, you know, you're, you're supposed to be more engaged with this. And it goes back to the, the attention span thing. You know, as an American, you you have an obligation to be more, pay more attention to this and care a little bit more about it. Like, don't be asking me if I thought it was worth it. Like my husband signed up, he was sent to war and he was killed as a result. Right. And that's that's not on me like that's you too you know um so you know it's complicated obviously um and you would know a lot more about it than i do but i definitely think that you know the objectives have been were stated at the beginning and then they kept kind of moving um as we went along and that's not a great way to uh try and win a war but I guess they would say their defense would be well we're not going to state when we're leaving because the enemy then knows when we're leaving they just wait us out which Maybe that's an argument too. Yeah, I 
I mean, I think timelines are are somewhat irrelevant, right? So, I mean, they can mm-hmm. pay, they can uh, play a contributing factor to minimum success criteria, and then kind of withdrawal decisions, like based on how successful you've been up to this point doing accomplishing X. Um, you know, I think what did uh, I think it was uh, Millie or somebody was was openly talking about. Well, what are we going to do about? you know, the Afghan girls schools now or whatever. And you're like, dude, you've had 20 years to fix yeah. Like, if you guys haven't done any, anything by it now, like, it, too little, too late, dude. Like, I, I yeah. can't voice the level of frustration uh, because this would be a whole other episode for us. To talk about it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> be honest with you, but the level of um, incompetent bureaucracy is right. Right. running the war and justifying decisions because you had a lot of attorneys that had a lot of like say as to mm-hmm. who was doing what. You know, you can be 15 Ks from the Af- or the Pakistani border and your rules of engagement are thin. Right. Of a bottom. Exactly. Like, hey man. Um I'm getting you, shot at. I'd appreciate not having to like go through that. <laughs> like I, I don't think the attorney that president that the enemy is worried war. about being 14 miles rather than 15 miles from the border. But thanks. Like really appreciate the help from a phone call away. Thanks a lot, guys. Yeah. Like, I mean, that stuff just make no sense to me. How the lawyers were running everything and ruining everything and putting people in harm's way and you know, just being able to respond to something like that. Like, hey, we're getting shot at from a place that we're technically not allowed to go. Right. Let me call the lawyer. <laughs> sure. Let me okay. call my lawyer and make sure I can blow that oh thing up. God. And just guys thinking they're going to get, you know, hauled back into, you know, court martial when they get home or whatever. I mean, come on. You can't fight like that. No, I knew I, I, that was a constant conversation for some of us in yeah. like around 2010 when I was there. It was like, Man, I really don't want to fuck up here. Like, I, not that you're you're not looking for any opportunity to make a mistake, but you're also looking for like, wow, I like I really have to be careful, and not because I have to be careful because I'm afraid of getting my legs blown off or getting you know shot in the head. I'm afraid of going to jail. Yeah, I'm afraid of going to jail in the United States because the thing that we saw was a shift from the uh, George W. Bush administration to the Obama administration as they were. What what really got a lot of us like like uh, di- directly kind of uh, engaged on this conversation was uh, they started questioning the the CIA on their mm-hmm. interrogation methods, you know, right. and interrogation methods. And we're mm-hmm. you know, I thought back to two thousand three, and you know, we invaded a country, and there was no manual for you know. Right. Uh, questioning of you know people that y- you would have under your control. Now, granted, we have the Geneva Convention, right? We understand that, and we're read into it, and we understand it very well. But if the expectation was that we were going to be able to predict the future of what would be legal or illegal based on who didn't like Dick Cheney and who did like Dick Cheney, like that's right. not my fault. <laughs> like, no. I guess, like no. for us, we were like. Whoa, hold on. Wait, wait, what's going on? Like, we, we don't want any of this. Like, we're just trying to do our jobs and, you know, do kind of what we signed up to do. We definitely don't want, uh, we, we definitely don't want this type of, uh, I would say the, the scrutiny is fine. The level of scrutiny and by whom, yeah. totally different conversation. Uh, yeah. Well, it, talk about gaslighting, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I mean, that was the thing. It's like you guys were going in relying on their training, what they were trained to do. And you were, you were also up against an enemy that doesn't pay attention to the Geneva Convention. Right. So it was this whole thing where it's it's not that war is ever fair, but it it wasn't like fighting a conventional military where there's a basic understanding of what is ethical and what is not, right? I mean you're dealing with people who have no rules. Uh, you're trying to get information from them so that they don't fly planes into a building again and kill thousands of innocent people. Right. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I remember, I remember the hearings on Capitol Hill and that was a matter of, you know, politics getting involved with policy and, and decisions that are being made half a world away. And that results in, really dangerous, deadly consequences for people who are doing the work, like doing the hard work or putting their lives on the line to get a job done that their country sent them to go do. 
and you have bureaucrats and politicians who have a political agenda using that as an opportunity to go after their own political enemies. And it's never, it's never the, the, the people who they're opposed to, that get in trouble, right? Like Dick Cheney is doing just fine. Yeah. It's like guys like, you know, who went over and put it all on the line, who end up getting uh, court-martialed for making a mistake on the battlefield after they were relying on the training that the government gave them. Right. I mean, that's the whole thing. It's like, this is how you taught us to do this. So if you want to change it. Great. But don't, you know, act like we did something wrong when we were doing doing it the way that you taught us to. I mean, that's crazy. Well, the, in the moral accountability or culpability, uh, who's really at fault, right? So if you're going to, you know, talk about who's doing what on the battlefield, well, who sent them there in the first place? Mm-hmm. What are they yeah. doing there? You have to follow it all the way up, right? You have to follow the accountability all the way up. And, uh, there's a section of our society that I think is willing to do that, which leads me to my next uh, question, which is outside of yourself, uh, who are you looking at? Like, who are your favorite journalists? Who's doing the best work out there? Okay, that's a great question. Um, so there's a couple of different buckets of things that I, I like to follow. All it's your... not all necessarily, <laughs> necessarily political. Sure. Um, so I really like what Joe Rogan's doing just because it's like he's on the forefront of the culture issue and he just right. does, he's too good for the Spotify, the triggered Spotify employees to make a difference. You know, every week there's some outrage about how they don't like a show and they're right. all offended. Yeah. But it's like, well, he's too good to cancel. So sorry. Sorry. Can't do that. Sorry about that. Uh, I think on the non-conventional media side, I think that Barry Weiss is really interesting she she covers a lot of really different topics that are not what everyone's covering on the day-to-day kind of news cycle of things right um i think at fox i really like what trey yinks is doing over in the middle east i think his coverage there is amazing He's very brave um awesome dude um Glenn Greenwald, he's been interesting to watch over the last couple of years because he's really kind of like left the intercept and decided he's going to kind of do his own thing. I don't agree with him on everything, but I think what he's doing is interesting. Um, yeah, and I like the work that we're doing at Town Hall too. I mean, we're sending people to the border. We're in the middle of all these issues every day. We're reporting on the White House. We're doing all kinds of stuff and providing kind of a different perspective um, than I think a lot of mainstream outlets in washington dc so i would say those are my a couple that i like i really like the ruthless podcast it's by a guy named comfortably spug and josh holmes and it's just really funny because it's it's totally inside political baseball but it's hilarious okay Uh, it's really good they call it the program okay and uh it's it's just very very good it's very funny so yeah those are the kind of the things that I'm, i'm into right now so so town hall, how big of a team is that over there? How big of a team do you guys have? We've got about eight full time people, so okay. we're pretty small, um, but we have a lot of columnists and um, lots of people who just kind of work really hard and get a lot done. So, right, yeah, got and a good long, crew. How long have you been over there? I've been there for over a decade, which is Seriously? crazy. Wow, crazy. Yeah, so I started there as an intern, and I've worked my way up to being in charge of a few things. So it's kind of fun. <laughs> that's super cool. I didn't realize you'd been there for a full decade. That's, yeah, that's, a full decade. Legit. So you're it's like, legit. Super loyal, hardworking, yeah. full decade. And then what's yeah. how do you how do you uh does did Fox just like start calling you one day and they're like, hey, do you want to like do some stuff with us? Is that how that worked? So the way that worked, this is actually a really funny story. Speaking of Greg Gutfeld. So I knew that I always wanted to do Fox. You know, it's part of why I was a broadcast journalism major. But I, there's this big conference called CPAC every year. And it used to be in DC, but now they've moved it out of town because of all the COVID stuff. And I would go every year as a college student. And I was always the one working every night, like going to events, had my resume. I had my own personal business cards. I was like, I wanted to get a job. Whereas all of my other friends were out partying, right? So I would go to that as a college student. My first year as a young professional working for a town hall full time, I was in this cocktail reception and I saw Greg Gutfeld walk in with his producer and his booker. 
And this room was packed. It was so hot. I still remember. And I thought to myself, okay, I got to go over and introduce myself. I'm going to play it cool. I just want to meet the guy. Like I have to go say hi to him. And I'm getting closer and closer. And if you know, Greg, he whines about everything. And I hear him complaining that the line for beer is way too long and that they're going to leave. Like, oh my gosh, they can't leave. They cannot leave. I have to go (laughs) introduce myself. So I pushed myself over there and I said, I will, I'll get you a beer. What do you want? And so I cut the line at the drink line. I got them their beers and I walked back and I handed them their drinks so they wouldn't leave and introduced myself. And so they eventually invited me on the show. So I bought a bus ticket from DC to New York for $25, a bus ticket. Solid. It's about a five hour drive. Yeah. And I'm so excited. I'm getting out and going on red eye. It's going to be great going on Fox. This is my dream. I'll stay with my brother. He goes to school in New Jersey. I'll just stay in his dorm room with him. So I'm on the, the, the bus for two and a half hours and that big tsunami hit Japan. So they call me and say, we have to cancel the show because of the tsunami in Japan. Right. And so I'm already on the bus. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm already on the bus. I'm going you know, to New York. I guess I'll stay with my brother for the weekend. But I'm so bummed because I think I'm never going to get back on the show. Right? I had my one shot, missing it. It's never going to happen. Get back. They ask me to come on again. Okay, so I buy another bus ticket. I go up. I do the show. And they didn't pay for your travel, but they would pay for like a fancy town car to take you wherever you were staying in New York. Maybe. So I got in this town car. <laughs> I have them take me to my brother's dorm room at his college across the river in Hoboken. And the driver looks at me when I asked to be dropped off and he goes, are you sure this is the place that you need to be dropped <laughs> off? <laughs> I said, yep, this is the place. So I slept on my brother's dorm room floor where he stayed with two other guys. And that was my first Fox News appearance. But um, on the more you know professional side, uh, I was doing some TV just generally here and there. But then I wrote my first book, which became a New York Times bestseller. I was doing more TV and then I was working on actually Larry Kudlow's CNBC show sometimes. And I got offered a contributorship with CNBC and with Fox and I chose Fox. So it was really my first book that kind of gave me credibility. <laughs> the red eye thing wasn't really my trip, my ticket to uh, credibility on the network, but it was fun. It was a nice little foot in the door. <laughs> what was your first book? It was called Fast and Furious, Barack Obama's Bloodiest Scandal. And it's shameless oh, yeah. cover up. Yeah. Yeah. So that was my first one so long ago now. But that was that's really how I kind of got into more serious television. What well, that would be a whole other episode, which I would love to try to to bring you back. Yeah, to. sure. I'm furious because how this didn't get more news coverage, I have no mm. idea. Like I I still to this day I'm like, I have no idea this this yeah. whole thing did not get more uh uh, eyeballs on it. So it'd be interesting just to unpack that again, because I'm sure that you've had more information since that book came out that yeah. you able to, to, to add some additional insight. I feel like I could have written a second book seriously after the first book, but it's interesting how things come so full, full circle because right now uh, they're trying to push through David Chipman as the ATF director. Mm-hmm. And it just reminds me that, you know, when you have political people who are, proponents of gun control in charge of the ATF, really bad things happen. People get killed. Mm -hmm. They lose machine guns on the streets. I mean, this is, these are things that happen. These are, these are, this is not an exaggeration. These are all of these things have happened. And so it's, it's not just a matter of having someone you disagree with on policy in charge of the Bureau. It's that we've seen this play out before and the consequences are deadly for hundreds of people. Uh, including law enforcement agents, and so it's a, it's a big problem. And for anybody who's not familiar, you know, Fast and Furious was this operation during uh, the Obama administration where they purposely gave Mexican cartels thousands of rifles yep. that they then used in crimes in Mexico, and they used um, to kill uh, Border Patrol agent Brian Terry. And so it just you're right. I mean, the fact that it didn't get as much attention as it deserved is absolutely insane. But I, I worry that with this new appointee they're trying to put in, uh, that a lot of lessons haven't been learned. And you were talking about accountability for decision-making. I mean, pretty much everybody 
who made those decisions for that operation got promoted. You know, they would they would taken out of their field offices and brought back to Washington, D.C. as a punishment, which is really just a promotion and a way to keep them from um, to keep them at headquarters. So they're not you know out in the wilds where they can right. make other decisions or talk to press. Um, so that's a problem. I mean, this idea that none of these people, besides the, people, the whistleblowers, of course, whose lives were completely destroyed by their superiors and by the Department of Justice, um, the fact that they're still working there in a lot of instances and that someone who is a very political activist uh, who wants to turn millions of law-abiding citizens into felons overnight by banning their lawfully acquired firearms, right. um, that's a problem because they always act like they can separate their personal beliefs from their jobs. And we've seen over and over and over again, that's just not true. We saw it with the FBI in 2016 when they were spying on Trump and the campaign. Yep. We saw it during Operation Fast and Furious when they were pushing um, for more gun control and using <laughs> using their actions of giving cartels thousands of weapons uh, as justification for their gun control while lying to all of us about what was actually going on. So it's not not a great situation. The fail, the whole failing up thing, uh, is only something I think you see in government. Uh, yeah, I, I would agree with that. I think you see yeah. it much more prevalent in government. You know, it's the fuck up, move up. Uh, mm-hmm. Yep. You know, um, you know it's that that that's a totally. I I would love to have that episode because that's like that's a that's a totally different one. I I'm now I'm gonna have to get yeah. that because I just realized that 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 was your book. So. Look at me, like the host with like the most egg on his face ever. Where I'm <laughs> fascinated by this, and I didn't even realize that you'd written that book. So that's my fault. Oh, uh, so it was a long time ago. It's okay. <laughs> it was, it's a long time ago. So what's 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 next uh, for you uh, in your professional career? You got anything that you're doing this year that's like super exciting? You got any new books coming out? Like what's what's up with you? I should be writing another book, but I'm currently not. Um, <laughs> <laughs> when I wrote my first two books, I had fewer responsibilities in terms of full-time work. So I feel like it's harder now. And I also feel like the uh, the industry's changed and the dynamic of, of news has changed. I mean, things happen so quickly that if you're going to write a newsy book, by the time you hey. write it and publish it, it's old, right? So it's kind of like, is it really worth the time to, to do it? But I'd like to do another one. Uh, this year is kind of, I'm not going to say it's an off year because everything is always busy, but there's not a, a major election this year. So kind of taking some time to to get out West and hang out with my dad and going to Wyoming in, in uh, October nice. for an antelope hunt. So I don't have a, a big answer on the career question for you, but uh, I think this year I'm going to take a little time to do some stuff that's been kind of packed away over the last four years, which were insanely nuts. <laughs> and then, uh, wait for next year's election. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah. You de- you deserve a slack year. That I mean, honestly, after it's likely a slack year. It's just going to be a, a year of maybe like doing a few things that I haven't been able to do for a while. So, uh, yeah, I think I think. Take that in the purest form of compliment. You deserve a slack year after the last four <laughs> years. Because, I mean, this has been nuts. It's been, it's been nuts. It's been yeah. nuts. I, yeah. I mean, it was awesome. It was awesome. Yeah. It was like skydiving every day. Just like your hair's <laughs> falling back. Your face is all like stretched out. Uh, it was great. But, you know, it was a lot. So, yeah. Awesome. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll invite you back. We, we'll talk fast and furious. Yeah. We'll talk uh, Antelope Hunt, Wyoming, whatever you want to talk about. Thank you so much, Katie, for showing up. I love, I love watching you out there. Thank you, uh, thank you. I, I can't, I can't thank you enough for all the support too. Because I mean, crush it. Love seeing you. You know, packing pistols, shooting, drinking black <laughs> rifle, like it's awesome. So, thanks. well, I love black rifle. I love your company, and thank you for everything you guys do over there. I really appreciate it, and uh, hope to see you soon in person. So. Yeah. One of these days. We'll, we'll One get- of these days. I'll make it happen. 